Good morning. How's everybody this morning? I can tell you're still fellowshipping from a Christmas weekend of some sort, Christmas parties. We're going to sing together, so uh, Christmas carols, it came upon a midnight clear. sing it very often even during this season but there is rich words in those that poetry uh, if you ever get a chance to go back and read it pastor danny daniels come and get us started good morning I want to welcome you worshiping with us and those viewing online on facebook let me make some announcements uh, right after I open up with a word of prayer. By the way, before I forget, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, just a few days away. It's kind of crept up on, on some of us, but uh, we rejoice. And, of course, we know the reason for the season. Father, we come before you, and we thank you that we can rejoice this Sunday today. We thank you, God, for the gift of your coming into this world, the incarnation we ask, Lord God, that during this season and during this time that we'll focus upon the greatest gift of all, and that is the eternal life that you gave to us by your coming into this world, by your going to the cross, by paying the price for our sin, by resurrecting to proving the power and the efficacy of all these things. Lord, we eagerly anticipate your return. But in the meantime, as we wait, let us love you and serve you. We thank you that we could worship you in your house and along together with your family. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome you today and just a couple of reminders. We'll be having our Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve, 6 to 7. It'll be a wonderful time of fellowship and uh, just a great, great time. Also, let me remind you that uh, I just praise God for the faithfulness of our people in the giving of their tithes and offerings. And let me remind you that the Wadi Moon Christmas offering for missions will be going on until the middle of January. So we have that time and that opportunity also there of giving and supporting our missions. You may not be aware, but our denomination, we're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm proud to be a part of it. I went to Southern Baptist College and seminary and school and, and things, but the beautiful thing about Southern Baptist Convention isn't that we're the largest numerically of denominations in America or have the most churches, but our missions, our international mission board, and our home mission board, supporting missionaries. Are you aware that there are more career missionaries from our group than any other all over the world? I'm talking about career missionaries and giving Lottie Moon supports them and that is the big area of their uh, support. So what a wonderful generosity that our church always displays. So let me just remind you uh, of missions. It's all about missions. Christ came on mission. So we just rejoice in what God is doing. I'm so grateful for Greg and Audrey leading us in our music and, and worship time. It's just so great and so wonderful. And so they prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word. It's all working together. So Greg, you come and, and lead us. And I thank you for what you do. I think I can say this for both Audrey and I is that it's ministry for us. It's not just a job. It's just not something we have to do because nobody else will. It's because we like what we do. So leading in worship and playing the piano, am I, am I right, Audrey? We love doing this. So we're going to um, move right into our Advent. This is the fourth Sunday of Advent. So today we'll read a little bit. We'll light the candles. But then on... Uh, Christmas Eve and our candlelight service will do the, the last portion of Advent and light the Christ candle. So we'll continue with what we're doing today. So on this fourth Sunday of Advent, as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of love. On this day, we remember God is love. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. On us. That's 1 John 3.1. This is how God showed his love. He sent his love, pardon me, he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That's 1 John 4, 9. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that's John 13, 34 and 35. So as we anticipate Christmas, let us remember our loving Savior, how he came once as a baby, that the world through him might be saved, and how he will return in glory. So would you pray with me, please? Father, we're so grateful that you love us. I don't think we could even imagine that in our own world you would have ever loved us the way you love us now. So we thank you for that. And you've showed that love by sacrificing your son, Jesus. Help us now to prepare our hearts to receive him in this service and in our hearts and in our lives through this season. Bless our worship today and help us to hear and do your word as we progress through the rest of this season. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, how he loves you and me. We're going to sing that through.
us sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, as we continue with the Christmas thought here this morning. Cindy's favorites, Mary, did you know?
Wow, I can guarantee you today that that was the best solo heard in any church in America today. Audrey, thank you so much. That actually moves me to tears, and I'm, I'm a hard guy, okay? I'm a very hardened man. God bless you. Thank you so much. Let me, let me get my composure here so I can preach. We're, we're encountering the presence of God through the music, through your presence being here. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Book of Matthew, chapter 1. I'm going to preach this morning on the unsung hero of the first Christmas, and that's Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, and the betrothed husband of Mary, and then later the husband of Mary. There at the birth of Christ, there in that manger scene, there's a trinity. There's a trinity. Joseph, Mary, and the baby Jesus, just like in heaven. We, as believers, we know the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So this morning, I'm going to take a look, and we're going to dissect uh, this passage of Scripture. And I hope it speaks to your heart. And even though we're talking about a man, this also applies to the wonderful ladies in our congregation also. Titled the message is Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus Christ. Joseph. Uh, I, I've titled the message, The Resume of a Righteous Man and the Right Man. By resume of a righteous man, uh, the Holy Spirit and the recording of the scripture attested that Joseph was a righteous man. And, you know, that's one of the best things to be called, is to be called a righteous person in Christ. I say he was not only just a righteous man, but he was also the right man. The right man to have custody of the baby and child, Jesus. So let's take a look. We're going to take a look at the event, the eternal, and the example, which would apply to our life. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And this is a very familiar passage, the Christmas story. Uh, the last Sunday before Christmas in the year 2021. Here we go. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ. And notice the word birth. He didn't just mystically appear on planet Earth or come out of an egg shell or, you know, like remember the old Mork and Mindy, the Martian Mork uh, played by Robin Williams allegedly came out of an egg in a spaceship and, okay, that's TV, that's comedy, that's fantasy, but here we're looking at truth and reality. The birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, and that's engaged. And by the way, back in that custom and culture, to be engaged, you were officially contractually bound to be married. And to break the engagement, you didn't have to get an attorney, but you contractually, through paper, had to break it, had to break it off. So this is, this is serious stuff. Uh, it says here that uh, when they were betrothed, uh, they, before they came together, and you know what that means, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Uh, think about where she was found. Just imagine the discovery. I found out, hey, I'm pregnant. But wait a minute, I've never been with Joseph. I'm, we're saving ourselves, each other, for the wedding. Now, well, wait a minute, how can this be? But notice, uh, she was found to be pregnant with a child by the Holy Spirit, the divine, divine seed. It's majestic, magical, and mysterious. I can't totally explain it. I can't understand it. It's just one of those things that we accept by faith. The seed in, in Mary's womb was that of the Holy Spirit. And that's a God at work. That's a miracle. Then it goes on to say, verse 19, now check this, and Joseph, her husband, so he's called husband here, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, there it is, he wanted to do the right thing in the right way at the right time because he was righteous and the right man and the right man to be the stepfather or the custodian having the 
custody of the baby Jesus and the young boy. Now, tradition tells us that Joseph was much older than Mary. I've read some history, some books that said Mary could have been 13 or 14 or 15 or, or 16 years old. I, I don't know about that. I wasn't there. And that Joseph was a much older man. Of course, that's relative. Much older man. It, that's a little bit uh, relative. And after the birth, uh, and uh, we don't hear anything about Joseph. We don't hear anything about him being at the cross as Mary, the mother, was. So it is believed that he passed passed early uh, there and uh, left uh, Mary as a widow. But notice, uh, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her. Wow, that says so much about the character and the temperament of Joseph. In his greatest hurt, in his greatest wounding, in his greatest psychological bleeding, uh, he doesn't want to disgrace Mary. But it says he planned to send her away secretly. Verse 20. But when he had considered this, now this is beautiful. He didn't act impulsively. He didn't go off the handle and this and that. But uh, notice it says that he had considered this. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, you know what? If we're patient... We don't go off the deep end. We don't get it impulsive. We wait upon the Lord. Guess what? The Lord will speak to us and reveal to us, either through his word, through answered prayer, through another brother or sister in Christ. Sometimes, sometimes, even in a pastor's sermon. Okay. Uh, he considered, verse 20, this, and behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David. That's a great connection there. Joseph, son of David. That means Joseph is royalty. He's, he's royalty. So, so is Mary in the royal line. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what a mind-blowing thing that was for that man? How different, how... Uh, well, by the way, uh, that's the most unique birth in the history of the world. It's the most unique, unique thing. Um, later on, we'll see the prophecy of the actual virgin birth. And the virgin birth makes Jesus uh, a unique person. It, it gives Jesus unique parents. It gives Jesus unique power and especially a unique purity. He was in the world, but not of the world. He was in the world, but he never committed a sin. Yes, he was tempted, as all of us are. Perhaps this week you were tempted somewhere, some way, somehow. Temptation is not a sin. It's a testing. And, uh, and if we yield, yes, it, it is sin. But Jesus was tempted, as the scripture says in Hebrews, like no other was. By the way, the closer you walk with God, the more temptation can come your way. Just because of the spiritual sensitivity in your life. And you, you see things and you realize and understand. I love this, verse 20, but when he considered this, verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. The word Jesus means Yahweh or Jehovah saves. Jesus, salvation. Salvation comes in Christ. God saves. So the name of the Savior is Savior. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, now all this took place to fulfill that which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And of course, that's Isaiah, verse 23, quotes Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. In the Old Testament, we see God for us. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see John and the other writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. God is with us, but in the letters of Paul, the epistles, God is in us through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. God is 
for the Christian, not somebody up there, or there's a boundary and there's a steel curtain that you've got to break through to, to have it. No, he is with us. He is in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. We see, once again, a virgin shall bear a son. You shall call him Jesus, Emmanuel. Verse 24 and 25, Joseph awoke from his dream and did Perhaps the most important word in all of this beyond the names of Jesus, Savior, Emmanuel, is the word did. Did. Notice Joseph immediately awaking from the sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. Uh, Joseph was a ditter. Okay? Joseph was a, a ditter. He did what God told him to do. He obeyed, and I challenge all of us that the year 2022, we all be didders. That at the end of the year, it can say we did what God wanted us uh, to do. He did. Verse 25, he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And notice, Joseph called his name Jesus. There's a, another double obedience. Father, I pray that you take this passage of Scripture, and as I dissect it and pick it apart and share it, that you'll speak to our hearts and minds, for I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We see this very first Christmas, the very first Christmas. We see the unsung hero of Christmas is, is Joseph. Yes, we see Mary. And we see the baby there, uh, and the manger scene, and everything there. But uh, we need to take a look at the resume of a righteous man. By the way, the Holy Spirit, God calls him a righteous man. How's that for a blessing? To be, you know, I mean, it's a blessing if somebody says to me, Danny, you're a righteous man. Danny, you're a good preacher. Danny, this. But you know what? It's even better when God says something like that. And Joseph was called a righteous man by heaven. But not only is he a righteous man, he is the right man. He is the right man to be the stepfather of Jesus Christ, to be the husband of Mary, and to have custody. So the word custody or custodian, I want us to keep that in the back of our minds because that's an important illustration for the message of this morning. Custody. God trusted Joseph to have the custody of God's son. Can you imagine what that implies? God trusted the man Joseph, a righteous man, a good man, a non-impulsive man, a man who thought things through, a man that had wisdom. God trusted Joseph to be the guardian and the custodian of God, the Son of God. Wow. Well, let's take a look. We see, number one, if you follow along in your outline, we see the event. This is the event. This is the event that the Old Testament leads up to by type and shadow and prophecy. This is the event, God becoming flesh. John, the Gospel of John, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only one begotten of the Father, notice next, full of grace and truth. Jesus came. The Word became flesh. Theologically, it's called the incarnation. Incarnation. Incarnate. That's meat. You know, you have chili con carne. That's chili with meat. Incarnation. God put on meat. God put on flesh. God put on human DNA. We see that God became flesh and dwelt among us. And he was full of grace and truth. That's a, that's a beautiful thing about Jesus. He was full of grace and truth. Notice those two things, grace and truth. I want us to recognize the perfect balance of Jesus Christ. 
balancing grace and truth. Now, if it was all grace and no truth, that'd be wishy-washy, anything goes, no commandments, you know. If it was all truth and no grace, uh, that, that'd be a rigor, that'd be a, a pharisaical thing. But notice the perfect balance between grace and truth. The perfect balance. And in our own lives, we need to learn to balance in dealing with ourselves, in dealing with one another, our children, our grandchildren, our spouses, our neighbors, the marketplace, and wherever, uh, to deal with people balancing grace and truth. Balancing grace and truth. He came full of grace and truth. We see the event in God's time. By the way, God is never early. God is never late with what he does. He always does it on time and his time. Paul writes about in the appropriate time, Christ came born of a woman. Born of a woman, and we see this with Mary. We, we see this with the prophecy of Isaiah of that virgin birth, the birth who is going to be called Emmanuel. We see the event in time and space because uh, the second person of the Holy Trinity voluntarily came into time and space. And I'm not going to explain time and space. That's left to the Einsteinian theorists and this and that. But what it means is that the eternal God from all of eternity, and people talk about eternity past. You know, we can understand a little bit eternity future, right? We can kind of conceive. But eternity past, maybe as some theologians say, it's a circle. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But we know that Jesus, second person of the Trinity, voluntarily said, I'll go. Like Isaiah said, here am I, send me. I'll go and teach and, and preach your truth. Jesus said, I'll pay for the sins. And that was a great, great cost and sacrifice. I don't think on a human level we can appreciate and understand the cost and sacrifice it was. Uh, Jesus theologically gave up something of his second person of the Trinity and things. And uh, there he is now as, as, as an eternal man with the scars on the nail prints and the side and things. Uh, we see that, the, we see the event. But we also see the eternal. We see the eternal in two ways. We, we see the eternal in that Jesus jumped out of eternity and willing to come into this world, into this time and space, to come into the mud and the filth and the dirt of this world, to take upon himself my sin, your sin, the world's sin. He said yes. He obeyed and was willing to do it. We see the foreverness, the foreverness of forgiveness, because that's why he went. He went to the cross to pay for our sins. And by the way, we have eternal forgiveness. That's why I call this the eternal, the foreverness of forgiveness. We as Baptists teach in what is called, doctrinally, what is called the security of the believer. And you may not be aware, or you may be aware, but a lot of church groups and a lot of denominations teach and preach that you can get saved, and then some years later you could lose your salvation, and you need to get saved again, and then something happens, or you go straight, you need to get saved again. Uh, the Bible says you must be born again, not you must be born again and again and again and again. And the Bible teaches that we are safe in Jesus Christ. And that if we truly are born again and saved, we are eternally saved. And there's nothing that we can do to lose it. Now, what happens if you stub your toe or break away from God or leave the church or whatnot? Uh, uh, you lose your fellowship with God and you lose the joy of your salvation. But if you were truly saved, uh, you will come back. You will come back. 
And some here and some watching on the internet, on Facebook, you've experienced uh, some of that. Uh, that's a reality. I'm so grateful for the foreverness of forgiveness. The foreverness of forgiveness. Here in this passage, we see the event, the first Christmas. God invading this world in the person of a little little baby. And it was a, a true birth. We had a discussion this morning in Lyle's Sunday School class uh, about the birth of, of Jesus Christ and the incarnation and uh, how God didn't have Jesus just show up at age 30. He shows up one day there outside of Jerusalem or in Bethlehem or Nazareth, and he shows up a fully grown 30 or 33-year-old man. That's day one. And then day two, he goes to the cross, dies for our sin, and then day three, or actually it would be day six or day five, he comes out of the tomb dead, and he's alive, resurrected, and, and he lives. No, to be fully man and to feel what we feel, and to understand what we understand in our humanity. There had to be a true humanity of Jesus Christ. So Mother Mary had a nine-month gestation. All you moms know what that's like. <laughs> and that's, you know, I'm so thankful to God that it's the women that get pregnant and bear the baby and the pain and not us guys, okay? Uh, I'm so grateful that Jesus came into this world and he experienced humanity. He experienced being a baby, being a child. Can you imagine Jesus as a teenager? Okay. The Bible says he never sinned, so probably never had that teenager attitude, maybe obedient to his parents and things. But uh, let, me, let me just stick with the, the biblical revelation. We, we see the foreverness of forgiveness. Total, complete, full forgiveness. So you can always rest assured. We Baptists use the term once saved, always saved. It's true, but it is biblically based. It is not a license to do anything we want to do and go against God and sin, knowing that we'll be forgiven and we still have a ticket to heaven. No, it doesn't work that way because we're saved. We'll want to do the best to our ability uh, of pleasing God and serving Him and doing what we know to be right. Remember, Joseph... The stepfather of Jesus was a righteous man, and he was the right man for the task. God trusted him to have custody of the Son of God in the baby's formative and child and, and preteen years. We see the event. We see the eternal. And now I, I want us to fathom the example the example of Joseph. Now, I know, I know, we, we, we can't be the custodians and guardians of the baby Jesus like Joseph. Can't be the stepdad, can't be, you know, the father and mother and the holy family and, and this and that. But you know what? We can live out the example and the mind and the heart and the attitude of Joseph in our life. All of us, men and women, boys and girls, teens, uh, we have an example here in this first Christmas story of the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, we can be and do what Joseph did. We can be and do what uh, uh, Joseph did. First thing, and this is a biggie, he displayed mercy, godly mercy towards Mary. Even though Joseph's heart was broken and his righteousness indignated by having a, a pregnant, espoused fiancé, which back in those days was, you were technically married, he must have just tore himself up inside, and he was, he was going to break it off. But he did not want to do anything that would hurt and, and wound Mary. Uh, look at verse 20. He considered all this. He considered all this. Verse 19, being a righteous man, he did not want to disgrace her, but planned to send her away secretly. 
course, we know no matter what circumstance or what situation people are in, there's always gossip mongers. So can you imagine? Can you imagine? Joseph displayed mercy, a godly mercy towards Mary. He, he loved Mary. By the way, a couple of lessons here about life. Uh, oftentimes in the world and in novels and in movies, you know, you, the love is ooey gooey and emotional and, and all that. And yeah, there's a part of that. Yeah, you, you sense and you feel something. But love, biblical love, takes the right action. It, uh, love is action. And it's the right action. And it's the action that puts the other person's best interest in a priority. Joseph loved Mary, and because of that, he wanted to protect her reputation. And he was going to take action. Love takes action. But when he understood the truth, when it was revealed to him by the angel of the Lord, by God, what was really going on? He immediately obeyed, and I'm certain, I'm certain the rest of his life, or what short years he probably had left to live at that time, he was so thankful that he didn't act impulsively, didn't go off on the deep end, didn't humiliate or betray Mary, but he did the right thing. Joseph displayed mercy, uh, I want to say, the God kind of mercy. Aren't you thankful that God has dealt with us mercifully? Remember back, I, I forget, 70s or 80s, uh, I forget what TV show it was on, what comedy, but that little skit called Here Come the Judge, Here Come the Judge, the guy's in a comedian in a black robe, and and it was a comedy thing, here come the judge, here come the judge, and things, and it was very, very popular and very funny. But you know what, I'm thankful that in my life there was not, here come the judge, here come the Savior and his mercy, and I said yes to the Lord God. Notice the example, he displayed mercy and godly mercy. Godlike mercy. To Mary, And one of the examples and one of the applications for us today is in the year 2022, coming up in a, in a week and a half or so, that let's commit that the year 2022 that we show God-like mercy to others around us, to just show and display God-like mercy. And love that takes action and, and takes the right action and is in the best interest of the one that is loved. Second thing we see about Joseph and Joseph's uh, commitment, as I touched this earlier, he was not impulsive but thoughtful. He thought these things through. I've discovered in my own life, and perhaps some of you, that when you take impulsive action, it's usually the wrong action, and then you've got to put a lot of energy to kind of fix it and straighten it out. But Joseph thought it through. Think about his mind. By the way, there's a, a scripture I want us to consider and look at. It's there in your outline, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And it is worth uh, us looking into Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, because Joseph displayed the mind of Christ, the mind of God. Not only the mercy of God, but the mind of Christ. Uh, and we can have that. We can, we can literally have the mind of Christ in us. How do we get that? Well, we read the scriptures, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we see what Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, when we see what Jesus did, what Jesus said, we can act like Christ and we can have the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul writes to his favorite church, by the way. Now, you shouldn't play favorites. But the Philippian church was his favorite church. Even when he was on death row, they wrote to him, told him how much they loved him, and sent him stuff and food and gifts and, and all that. And, and, and so the book of Philippians is basically a thank you letter that the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. And that was a great church. By the way, that church was founded by two women. 
And then Paul later, after the church was established, went there and taught and gave doctrine and, and teaching. And so uh, it was probably his favorite, most beloved church of all the ones that he was associated with or started. Uh, notice he says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. In other words, he had the full deity, but he was willing to give it up to go to the cross. He was willing to give it up to be a baby in a manger. He was willing to give up something so that you and I can have something. He existed in the form of God. But look at verse 7. He emptied himself. He emptied himself. There's a technical term for that. It's kenosis. K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Kenosis. There are theological books written about it, whole theologies about the kenosis of Jesus Christ. How he emptied himself for you and I on the cross. He emptied himself, verse 7, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Can you imagine? You're the creator. You're the eternal word. You empty yourself to the form of being a bondservant. You know what? In my humanity, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that for anybody. Maybe my wife and my daughter, I'd, I'd do it for. I'd sacrifice myself for. But I, I don't know if I could for anybody else. I, I don't know. But Jesus did it. Notice, he emptied himself. Uh, verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. This, this death wasn't just a death, but this was the death on a cross. The most vile, the most humiliating way of dying, of dying that that you could die. We have forms of capital punishment in our nation. Uh, some places it's hanging, some places it's a firing squad. California used to have the gas chamber and uh, most of these deaths, you instant death. Uh, but imagine the death on a cross purposefully. It took hours and hours, sometimes even days for a person, a criminal that was crucified, nailed to a cross to die. That's why it was a big deal that they found Jesus already dead. When, when they looked at the cross and, and they found he, he died. A literal death. He humbled himself, obedient even to the death on a cross. And by the way, people that were died on a cross were not buried in a grave or in a tomb. There was a mass burial. That's why Joseph, another Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, gave up his very, very expensive tomb and sepulcher so Jesus would have a place to be buried. And in the providence of the Holy Spirit, imagine this, if Jesus would have been put in a mass grave, There'd be no proof of his resurrection. But there's proof of his resurrection because there's the empty tomb. And then, of course, his ten, at least ten, recorded appearances. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. And then Paul writes in verse 9, for this reason, this is why. This is why we have what we have today. This is why we have churches. This is why we worship on Sunday. This is why we preach Jesus. For this reason, God hath highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name. You study history. You read books. You watch TV. There's names, 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 names. Zoroaster, Mohammed, Buddha, Lincoln, Kennedy. There's, there's names, names, names. Some names we revert. Some names are evil. Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Danny. No, I was going to say my name, but no. Just, just want to see if you're still with me. We see here that the name of Jesus is a name that's above every name. A name above 
every name. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. And notice verse 10, 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Oh, man, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Joseph, the stepfather of the baby Jesus and the young boy Jesus, was not impulsive, but thoughtful. He, he had the mind of God or the mind of, of Christ. Uh, he puts mercy first in dealing with with his fiance, As I said earlier, the love that Joseph displayed is love that takes action, but it's the right action, and it's for the benefit of the one being loved. A couple other things as I wrap this up this morning that, that we see about Joseph. We, we see not only that Joseph displayed the God kind of mercy towards Mary, and that he was not impulsive, but thought things through. Uh, number three, we see Joseph's integrity and legacy. We see his integrity. Now, interestingly enough, uh, integrity uh, also is a mathematical term from the term integer from the term integer, which means a whole, a, not divided up. And we see that uh, Joseph's heart was not divided up. You're not, it had that oneness once he knew the truth. Once he listened to God and obeyed God's word and God's truth from the angel of the Lord. We see Joseph's integrity and legacy. Uh, Joseph was tested, but he trusted. In the year 2022, we're all going to be tested one way or another. You can't avoid it living in this culture. We're all going to be tested. There'll be testing, but I hope the result is deeper trusting of God, deeper trusting of Jesus Christ. We see that integrity, that, that integrity integrity and the legacy, the legacy that uh, Joseph left. We see the, the example, the example of the unsung hero of the first Christmas, uh, uh, Joseph. Uh, Joseph knew the true story and understood God's will and the role of his life. He submitted, he surrendered, he listened when the angel of the Lord revealed to him, don't harm Mary, don't do anything against Mary. Yes, she's pregnant. It's not your child, it's not your seed, but you know what? This is the seed of the Holy Spirit. This is a God event. God is at work. And instead of saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. All I know is, is the physical. All I know is what I see, she's pregnant. No, he obeyed, he listened, and when Joseph knew the true story, and he understood God's will and the role that he had in God's bigger picture. By the way, all of us have a role in God's bigger picture. Some are bigger pictures, some are not as big pictures, but we have a role in God's picture for us. And I challenge us that as Joseph obeyed, we obey and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Joseph knew the true story, the true story and understood God's will and his role and how God would use him. The last thing about Joseph that we can copy, the last thing about Joseph that, that we can exemplify in our own life is once Joseph saw God's work, he left it in God's hand. I don't know, but in previous churches, you know, I, I had people that felt that they were uh, general managers of the universe, helping out God. First of all, God doesn't need our, our help. We need God's help. We need God's help. And we must submit and surrender. And once Joseph saw God's work and what this Christmas story is all about and who that baby was, uh, he left it in God's hands. 
One of the greatest things and best things we could ever do is stuff, perhaps even ugly stuff. Just leave it in God's hands. God could do a better job of fixing it than you or, you or I could do. Leave it in God's hands. Give it to God's timing, the, the, the event, the eternal, and, and the example. He left it in God's hands. A parting shot, a parting thought that would apply to all of us and to Arbor Christian Fellowship. Uh, I love this church, and I want to do what is right and what is best uh, for this church. And I don't want to get in the way of what God is doing, but obey, just as Joseph obeyed. But this is a very special and a very wonderful, unique church. And I knew about you before you knew about me. Uh, Arbor Christian Fellowship, just as Joseph had custody and was custodian of the baby Jesus, it dawned on me preparing this message that we're not just a church, not just another church among the 114 Southern Baptist Convention churches in Orange County and all the tens of thousands of churches. Uh, we, we are not just a church, but we have custody of God's house, of God's message, of God's truth. We are custodians. Now, we have a great set of church janitors uh, that clean up and take care of things. And we think of the custodian. And remember, uh, in school, the custodian and things. Uh, you and I and this church is a custodian of God's house, of God's truth, of God's people, and even people who are not yet God's people that will come through our doors. I'm hoping that in the year 2022, as the COVID thing and everything else and all that calms down and, and things go back to a normal, and I don't want to say a normal, I'd rather say a super new normal, a, a God normal, and things come back and, and all that, I, I'm waiting to see that we will have greater custody of the things of God. The church has custody of the word of God and we communicate, we communicate God's truth to a lost and, and dying world. We have custody of God's house. It's visible. It's viable. It's vertical because from here we are vertical in our relationship with God. We have God's house, God's truth and God's mission, God's mission. So I wanna, I wanna challenge you that during this Christmas time, I, I just wanted to give a little PR and a little publicity for Joseph, who is often the, the forgotten one of Christmas. Yes, the baby in the manger, everything the scripture says revolved around the baby in the manger because that was God in the flesh who came into this world, adored by Joseph and Mary, worshipped by the Magi, worshipped by the wise men. I used to call them the wise guys, and they were wise. Worshipped by the shepherds. Uh, we discussed this morning uh, in our Sunday school class uh, on the low life and the low estate of the shepherds. Uh, when they would go to the big city like Jerusalem, people would say, hey, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Get out of here. But God entrusted to the lowest of the low. Instead of Jesus being born there by the Roman Colosseum for all the world to see, or in Athens, the glory of grace, a smelly, stinky, can I use the word poopy, smelling? Oh, forgive me if that offends you, I'm sorry. But I'm trying to make a point. That's the place that Jesus went, the lowest of the low, and the shepherds, the lowest. The high God, the eternal one, humbled himself as we looked in the scripture. 
He's the custodian. As I close, close my Bible, I want to challenge us in the year 2022, have a Joseph-like attitude about our church, that we have custody and are custodians of the truth of God and the word of God. God could trust Joseph with his son. God trusts Arbor Christian Fellowship with the seed of the gospel and the good news of the gospel into our lives and into our community. God trusts Arbor Christian Fellowship as custodians having the custody of our children in vacation Bible school, Sunday school, children's church, our, our workers. God, we have a custody and we are custodians of the things of God. And let us not forget that in the year 2022. And when we have that, no matter what our size is, what matters is the custody. God is the one that gives the increase. And I'm hoping that in the early part of 2022, as things kind of settle down and all the craziness of the last year and a half diminishes, that we'll get back some of the attendances. I've talked to people that just don't want to go out in public. And I tell them, you do what your heart leads you. We love you. We miss you. We're, we're praying for you. And some have concerns. And you know what? I support them. I pray for them. I lift them up. But I'm looking for a great 2022. Why? Because we have custody of God's message, of God's word, of God's truth, and the custody of raising people in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So I challenge you to be like Joseph and ponder these things as he did. Let's stand together for a time of, of closing prayer. Before we dismiss, I want to just wish all of you a Merry Christmas. Uh, Happy New Year. See you on Christmas Eve uh, service. Greg and Audrey have planned a very beautiful, very meaningful uh, time of service from 6 to 7 on a Christmas Eve. Be, be a, a, a part of that. So let's go ahead and dismiss uh, in prayer. John? All right. Here's John. I love this man. What a blessing. Thank you, what, thank what you a so blessing. much. You bet. Well, thank you. Well, um, I was just thinking Pastor was talking about being a custodian, and uh, I'm not much uh, for changing names of uh, titles or anything, but if you look in the back of your bulletin, it says staff, Arbor staff, and staff is kind of, I don't know, mundane. So um, I'm going to call them compensated servants. Amen. So I want to, uh, <laughs> I want to present, uh, call up, uh, Audrey, and then uh, Greg, Marlon, could you come up to the stage? Come on up. And then Sandy's not here, but I'll make sure she gets, gets her Christmas card. And there's a small token of our appreciation for all you do. And I know uh, there's a lot of hours that you put in that we don't even see, but uh, we just thank you for that. And there's one for Audrey. And then Marlon. And then uh, Greg. And Pastor Danny. I'd like you to give him a round of applause, and I'll go ahead and um, dismiss us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the, these servants that uh, put in the time and effort to uh, just keep this uh, your church uh, going and, uh, and running. I just know that there's so many parts of this that, that we don't even know that happened. And there's uh, ministries that are not being represented here today, but we just thank you for their hearts and their, their leadership. And we just uh, know that you're in control and that we're going to have a wonderful 2022. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank God you. Thanks, John. Thank you.